I have uh, right at top of the hour, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, hi, everybody. This is David Knorr, and uh, I'm delighted you're here. Uh, I, I can't tell you how uh, personally I'm excited about this this uh, this opportunity. This next book uh, is uh, crazy to believe. Book number ten. Uh, I've been thinking about these ideas for four to five years. Uh, with all due respect to all the women in my life and uh, all the women executives I know, all the great moms I know, I tell all my male friends, this is the closest thing we'll ever come to giving birth because you're at some point, you've read enough, you've talked enough, you've shared enough insights about an idea that you feel like you have something to say. Uh, and if you call my baby ugly, I'm not sure how long I'm going to stay friends. But thanks for coming. Um, the goal of this session, the series, is really share with you some insights from uh, 100 plus executive interviews, uh, countless client examples and case studies and social science research we've done, and uh, give you uh, some insights into uh, common challenges I see across multitude of client companies. But more importantly, I, I don't believe everybody's damaged. This is also an opportunity to really take advantage of some upside uh, and all the changes, all the dynamics that, that we see in the market. So a couple of very quick housekeeping notes. Number one, uh, I'm digitally recording this session, and we'll make the recording available uh, on, on our website. Number two, uh, I'm fairly active on social, so just my handle is just at David Knorr, and I'm using the co-create book hashtag as a great way for us to capture key ideas and come back and continue the conversation. So um, if you are not familiar with me or my work, uh, I've spent the last, crazy to believe, two decades really focusing on, on strategic relationships. And, and I'm passionate about both um, uh, the, the key ideas that I'll share with you, but also hopefully living some of those in kind of what I, the work I do with clients and, and clients that, that engage me multiple times and clients who candidly become friends. Um, I focus strategic relationships on growth, on enterprise growth, on individual growth, on team growth, um, and I've yet to meet a company that can cut its way to growth. So I, 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 hard, I have a hard time working with a company that says, you know, our people are our greatest asset and first sign of economic downturn to lay everybody off. Uh, and if you think about what happens when times get tough, if you think of the most recent recession in 08, what did people cut back on? Advertising and marketing, right? Travel and training and development. Three of the worst places you can cut. Uh, and fourth one would be innovation, right? Um, so I, I, I like to focus a lot on both individual um, team and uh, organizational growth, if you will. Um, I speak 50, 60 times a year. I spoke 62 times last year. I'm, I'm blessed to speak to you know massive audiences, but also as much I like that the small intimate groups. Um, I'm doing a lot more facilitation of panels, but not just as a facilitator, but really engage them. This was for the Society of American Military Engineers. Those four individuals up there combined have well over. Uh, <laughs> Uh, 200 billion dollars in annual budgets um, to you know really lead the infrastructure of our country and this was a great great gathering of, of these folks um, I consult a lot of uh, P&L executives a lot of brands you, you certainly would recognize and then I also do a lot of executive coaching uh, some 28 30 executives have gone through my program in the last couple of years and I and I really get a lot of uh, just it just fulfills my cup to interact and engage these executives who, as most of you know, the higher you go, the lonelier the job becomes, and, and they really are struggling with some uh, kind of strategic strategic challenges and opportunities. I write uh, articles, blogs. You want to read more about my writing? I, I'm putting a lot of my articles on LinkedIn uh, in the poll section, and articles is a good place to see some of my writing. As I mentioned earlier, Co-Create is, uh, is book number 10. Uh, the other thing I do is, uh, there's some of the other ones. Um, on a personal side, I have a young family. Uh, it's ridiculous that teenage kids become better skiers than their old man. I have crazy dogs. Uh, love, love these two. On the left is an uh, Australian Shepherd Bernice Mountain Dog called Buttercup. And on the right is a Siberian Husky named Barkley, 
but they're, uh, I told somebody else, they're the purest sense of unconditional love. Uh, I'm in scouting. I'm an old Eagle Scout, and my son is a couple ranks away from scouting, so we get a lot of enjoyment out of uh, what I believe are timeless values in scouting. And uh, that is not a Photoshop. That is not fake. That is your friend David Knorr. So crazy to believe. I do some of my best thinking uh, on a bike. And for those of you that might scare you, here's a more subdued one. Uh, I'm also uh, passionate about great causes. This is the uh, Distinguished Gentleman's Ride that supports uh, men's prostate and mental health causes. So that's about my background. The webinars are all going to be 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. Today we're gonna, I'm going to do an introduction. I hope you'll mark your calendar to come back a week from now. We're going to talk a lot about introspection. I, I meet way too many executives who don't make enough time, not just executives, just managers, leaders that don't make enough time to think and really think about what's gone well, what's not going well, what do we need to not just manage today, but really think about doing differently moving forward. So we'll talk a lot about that next time. Um, I'm trying to schedule these webinars around other commitments, including travel and uh, some off-site things I need to do. So uh, Thursday, April 6th, we'll talk a lot about this idea of adaptive innovation. Where do great ideas come from? Do you have a mechanism for capturing them and bringing them through the market, what I call through pilots and prototypes? April 11th, we talk about strategic relationships. Uh, I think it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart and, and, and fundamental to getting any kind of co-creation or collaboration done effectively. Uh, April 20th, we'll do we'll focus a lot on customer experience. And by the way, that customer is not just external. I work with a lot of clients where the relationship is focused on internal. So what does that experience look like? How do you know? How do you measure it? How do you track it? What are the fundamental stages to it? April 25th, we're going to talk about leading through provocation. I actually believe a certain amount of pushback is healthy in relationships. And if you're going to get this right, you've got to build an environment of candor. You've got to build an environment where people are not afraid of retribution. You've got to build an environment where people are willing to and they're open to talking about what they believe is a great idea or conversely a bad idea before you go off a cliff. May 2nd, we'll talk about this idea of spiral of growth. I've studied growth extensively and profitable growth in particular. And I'm going to show you, ideally, the spiral of growth you go through in any kind of a new idea or new approach. And Monday before the book is launched, we're going to talk about exceptional experiences and exceptional organizations. And May 9th is something that I've marked very clearly with highlights and post-it notes on my calendar is the publication date. And I'm proud to work with St. Martin's Press. They're part of Macmillan. They've been great folks to work with. And, uh, and that's when the next book will be available. So again, this is a series. Uh, I hope you'll find out all of this on our website, which is just, all you got to remember is cocreatebook.com. We're putting these dates and links for you to register on our website. And I hope you'll join me for future events. So in terms of today's agenda, I want to talk to you about relationship economics as a prequel. Uh, it, it really is fundamental. It is absolute epicenter of, of all of these ideas is, is few strategic relationships. So I'll talk more about that. I want to share with you the co-create premise, kind of the key ideas. And I want you to think about this idea of you next. What is the next version of you? What's the next evolution of you? What's the next chapter of you look like? Because just like relationships, you have to start by looking in the mirror. And a mentor of mine says there's a reason the airline safety videos tell us to put the oxygen mask on ourselves first before we help somebody else. Co-creation starts with you. And you thinking very differently about you about what you think you know, about what you, you're, you believe those experiences you've had will lead you to do. You have some biases, you have some unconscious biases, you have some strengths, and make no mistake about it, we all have growing edges. If you start with that premise, if you start with that core, if you start with that foundation, that's how you'll make co-creation and collaboration through co-creation a success. Right? So I want to talk more about that. And I'm going to really hopefully give you some practical ideas on how to start really thinking. And it starts with a mindset, um, how to start really thinking and leading differently, leading yourself, leading your team, leading your organization. So just a quick reminder, again, I will pause periodically. If you have questions, comments, insults, please use the questions section on the right-hand side of your GoToWebinar tool, 
and I'll pause to address any of those that, uh, that you may think of as we go through. So just like Star Wars, which I'm a huge fan of, it, it hasn't quite been 30 years, but it has been almost 20, where I've been talking a lot about this idea of quantifiable and strategic relationships. I call it relationship economics, and it really is the art and the science of relationships. And I would submit, just like a brand, just like repute, right, reputation, repute, just like credibility, relationships also have a quantifiable value. Relationships are also strategic. Relationships can also help accelerate your ability to get things done. I'm still out proving to individual leaders and companies and organizations that, um, and, and again, I can give you a very simple uh, idea of think of a, in a sales mode, think of a customer acquisition. Right? How long and how much does it take you to acquire a prospect and convert that to a customer? Well, we all know if, if a credible source walks us in, refers us, it accelerates our ability to get there. Now, you may write somebody's coattail to get in. At some point, you're still going to have to prove yourself, but it just dramatically cuts the, the, you know, it, the, all the filters or all the barriers for you to get in. Right? Or you know, I've worked with a lot of entrepreneurs over the years trying to raise capital. A lot of people that are trying to find great people, a lot of, uh, you know, that are looking for really strategic partnerships. Relationships in every scenario can accelerate, and time is money, can accelerate your ability to get there. So if you think about it, transactions often have an economic value, right? But sell them on their own, you think about little to no long term, right? I buy something from you, I hire you for a job, uh, you do a project for me. Any of those transactions uh, you know, are, are almost episodic, right? They, they're a sliver in our overall thinking, overall opportunities. Interactions can likewise either be transactional or very relationship oriented. And if I take those interactions a little deeper, let's say we went down the relationship route. I've, again, for a while I've been talking about three types of relationships. Your personal ones are friends, uh, neighbors, uh, golf, poker, vacation. They like you warts and all, right? They're a lot like us. They're also, you know, discretionary. We pick our friends. We pick who we choose to hang out with. Functional relationships you put up with because you have to. Let's be honest, your, some of your clients, some of your colleagues, you, they may not be discretionary. You may not necessarily pick who you work with, but they're still safe because of the context of your work together, right? Most people get the first two. Most people have plenty of the first two. It's the last one they miss out on, which are really strategic relationships. And I've been thinking about this idea for a number of years. Strategic relationships, by definition, elevate your thinking, elevate your perspective. They're often very mutually valuable. And again, I'm going to give you a very personal example. A lot of people, you know, highlight logos or, or rave about the clients they work with, right? But, but I've always believed you don't have a relationship with a logo. You don't have a relationship with a building. You have a relationship with individual. So that's my client, Phil, at KPMG. And if you look at the bottom left corner, I don't know if you can see it or not, but the date of that picture is August 22nd of 2006. Yeah, over 10 years ago, we've met, and over the years, we've worked on multiple projects. And I don't go to Phil when I need a project, right? I, I touch base with Phil, and, and we've done multiple things together. But when somebody on Phil's team, likewise, another Mary Heather, great lady, introduces me to a law firm, and I speak at their annual partner meeting, and, and I start to coach several of their executives, and... Right now, I'm working with one of their practice groups and really helping them become more intentional about the relationships. And that law firm merges with another global one, and they're, they're well on their way and doing some really cool things. But Phil just doesn't make the introduction. He shows up in Florida and introduces me at their annual partner meeting. Right? And, and it becomes more than just a referral, more than an introduction. It really becomes a strategic relationship. And again, you'll see some examples of other things I've done with Phil and company. And, and it really highlights relationships that start to shape not just where you are today, but where, where you're going. Think about it a second. Four ways to view relationships. They differ in really simple ways, but they're profoundly different outcomes in terms of your career, in terms of your organization. 
very quickly, a lot of people think of, if you think of self-orientation and other orientation, they think of tit for tat, right? They're matchers. You do for me, I do for you. The next tier is a little more challenging, and they're, they start to become polar opposites. Some people are on the right-hand side pure givers, right? They think of others all the time. God bless these people. I call them Mother Teresa, right? They're just very altruistic, very euphoric from just giving. They love to give. Beautiful people. Love those people. I don't know about you. I can't be just a pure giver because I've got something called a mortgage. And Adam Grant, the, the warden professor, has written a book called Givers and Takers, and he talks about this extensively as well. And the other side of the, the, the coin are takers. And I know you can also relate to these people. The only time they call is when they want something. You haven't heard from them in three years, and suddenly they're your BFF. You're, you're like, where have you been? Executives, unfortunately, do this, especially when they're looking for work or they're in transition. They network like mad while they're looking for work. And then when they find their next role, they forget everybody who helped them get, get there, and they go dark. And nothing wrong with focusing on the new job. As a matter of fact, I think it's critical. But you cannot you know, let your biggest asset, which is really your portfolio of relationships, go dormant or go dark, or go, go dark and, and not touch base with these people with value add. The very pinnacle of this are what I call relationship investors. They genuinely understand that it's a lot easier to ask for something if you start by investing. And this is how I try to live my life. This is how I try to work with my clients. And, and they, they, they really see that relationship um, as, a, as, a, as their biggest asset. And they won't do really silly short-term things because you know, they don't want to damage that longer-term relationship. If you think about it, most of us have really outdated ideas and outdated tools in how to manage some of those strategic relationships. And again, I've written extensively about this. One simple idea is is your priorities, right? Think about it. Whenever we're faced with a challenge or an opportunity, we often think about what should we do and how should we do it. We seldom think about who do I need? Who do I know? How do I start connecting the dots between the relationships that I have and the relationships that I need to accelerate my ability to get things done? So as you make your list of priorities, whether it's a New Year's resolution or it's your you know, project plan for this week or whatever your priorities are, Right? Do you often think about whose help do I need and how can I meet or engage these individuals? And, and fundamentally, if, if you want to elevate yourself above the noise, if you want to elevate yourself above the crowd, you've got to take a different approach than what everybody else does. And I would submit relationships have to start integrating themselves. And I coach a lot of people to think about this. Your organization, you guys got to decide to do things differently in, in each of these critical areas. And you got to proactively, you got to strategically, you got to quantifiably manage the relationships, not just the transactions. I've always said, give me somebody on a personal level, give me somebody's checkbook and their calendar, and I can tell you about their portfolio of relationships. Well, guess what? It works the exact same way in our business world. The relationships you choose to invest in often determine your direction, and they'll define your destination. Let me say it again. If we were to meet a year from today, I would just ask you, what relationships did you choose to invest in? Because they'll define your direction, and they'll ultimately define your destination. So with relationship economics, again, I, I, this is still a lot of the work that I do today. We've built models. We've built processes. We've built some critical terms that talks about if you want to reach a specific set of outcomes, you need to really think about the relationship component of uh, of who do you know? Who do you need? How can you invest in those relationships to accelerate your ability to get things done? In, in Relationship Economics book, on my website and blogs in various places, you also find examples of, of unique tools that we've built um, and a lot of good IP we've developed around this topic. But what we've seen in working with clients, what I've seen in working with clients over the years is some very specific results, right? Think about it. It reduces the transaction cost, right? Takes you less time to get things done. It absolutely deepens loyalty. I'm going to reiterate, you, you don't have a relationship with a logo, right? It's, it, it's not that building or that shopping center or that. It's the individuals of those companies that we choose to work with, right? Um, new opportunities, new opportunities that are not RFPs, new opportunities that, are, that haven't hit the, 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 the market yet, new opportunities that others may not have access to, and most importantly, taking relationships from these pockets around the organization to really um, creating a more institutionalized approach to how we think, how we lead from people we you know, invite to join us to the clients we choose 
choose to work with, to partners that we trust with our brand and go to market. Those are all critical relationships that we believe we can institutionalize. So keep all that as background in mind. Let me tell you about co-create and really the premise and just a reminder, um, we're using hashtag co-create book uh, at David Knorr. If you have questions, jump on the question section of go to webinar and I'll pause periodically to address those. So as I've done in the past, um, the way I write books is I start with a simple idea. I start with a simple question that, that basically becomes the guiding light for what I'm most curious about. And in this case, what I'm most curious about is if you were the competition, if you were your own competition, how would you disrupt you? Would, it, would you just drop the price? Well, I, yeah, you could. I, I just think that's a very short-sighted strategy because nobody wins in a price war. Would you add a new feature or function and say, hey, we do that a little bit better? Sure, but I'm not sure that lasts either. So this idea of disrupting your business, disrupting the, your value to the market, disrupting what you do and how you do it, is really the premise that I started thinking about this book. I've, I've been a student of business and business models for now, you know, a number of years. So I started looking at business models, and there's a whole bunch of them out there. Uh, you know, Michael Porter and his five forces. I'm, I'm taking you back to business school for a second. Obviously, very well known. There, there's, you know, several other people have talked about different go-to-market strategies, different business models, and I even found one actually around co-create. Two Indian gentlemen several years ago, you know, came up with the co-creation of value. And they call it a DART model, and the notion was the market, you see it, becomes a forum, becomes a conversation, becomes collaboration. I've also been working, I read a number of years ago, this idea of business model generation. Two Swiss professors um, wrote this book because they kept getting you know, asked the same questions about different business components. And then the first time I heard of a canvas or used a canvas was really the business, generation, business model generation canvas. Very clever. If you haven't read it, really good book and since then they've come out with value proposition design and a couple of other ideas. I also a couple of years ago attended a fast company summit. Now you heard earlier I speak at 50, 60 events a year and for many of those I try to go early or stay late if I can and hear other speakers and some are certainly better than others but also three, four times a year I make time. Let me say it again. I make time to learn and to grow and I attend events that are interesting, different, unique, others are going to present. And, and my whole litmus test is if I can take one idea away, I'm much better off than I was before. So this was the, this was the Fast Company Innovation Censored, and they came up with seven ideas, right? I don't think any of these are going to be surprised to you. Authenticity is critical. Innovation means real talk. It can be messy, right? It's born out of difference, not discomfort. Um, you got to court failure. You gotta, you know, if you refuse to adapt, you're gonna get disrupted. Ninety percent of brands live in the ad land, right? Let me tell you how great we are, uh, but consumers have already moved out. So put all that together, and 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 combine that with the consumer electronics show, where you go and see virtual reality and augmented reality, and you're thinking, how could this possibly apply to my world? And you see drones, and you start thinking, well, I'm not in the package delivery business. How is this gonna impact me? And you see not personal transportation vehicles. And you see the applications of drones in healthcare. And you start to look at just the proliferation of data that's coming at us. And you start thinking about the multiple generations that are doing things very differently. Such that, I love this comment, I saw a guy today at Starbucks, he had no smartphone, tablet, or laptop, he just sat there drinking his coffee like a psychopath. Right? Why else would you go to Starbucks or Panera Bread or any of those other places if it isn't to go use their Wi-Fi and get online? So we've become so enamored, and in that many ways, we're getting more accustomed to this incredible pace of disruption and change around us. And then we come back to our companies, and everybody wants change. Let me know if you've ever seen this. Right? Nobody really wants to change and very few people actually want to lead the change, right? You also get this sense from time to time. Hey, I, I don't want to risk anything. And unfortunately, I see this at board levels, right? They want the CEO to innovate. CEOs want their, you know, the next group to innovate. The next group of executives want their directors and managers to innovate. But by the way, do it without taking any risk. 
and don't 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 mess with our existing business, right? That we're making money, we're doing well, that project's going well, that initiative is on you know fine. Don't mess with that. Just but we want you to innovate. Innovation centers, innovation by itself has become this sexy, jazzy, cool thing that everybody wants, but nobody's willing to take risks to get there. So I read ferociously, and a guy named Matt Ballantyne talked about iteration, innovation, disruption. And if you think about it a second, innovation is doing right the same thing better. Innovation is doing new things. Disruption is doing new things that make the old obsolete. Iteration. We went from, you remember, uh, I'm dating myself now, you remember where we had TVs and we had to actually walk up to them and, and, and turn this knob to change channels, right? And then innovation came in terms of a remote control. And, and that remote control has gone through a bunch of different iterations and now I can talk to mine, and right? Disruption is when the television set starts to understand my likes and dislikes and preferences and behaviors and prompts me, would you like me to turn on your favorite news channel? Or here's your DVRs, right? Here's your recordings. Would you like me to show you the oldest? So, so intelligent TVs that understand and predict your behavior, in essence, makes the remote and the need for us to flip through 900 channels obsolete. So again, as I present these ideas, I want you to think about what are you doing in your respective world? Whether you're a frontline sales professional, we've had a couple hundred people on this, on this webinar today or you're a project management professional, or you're a manager, leader, events, finance, technology, what are you doing to iterate, innovate, and disrupt yourself, your team, and really lead or, 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 or certainly contribute to that happening in your company? Because here's what you need to understand. You've got to start thinking about how you compete. Business as usual, kind of what you've always done. It's often very transactional, right? The next deal, the next person, the next, uh, all right, there's a list. Here's, I, I, I genuinely believe pretty soon it's going to become irrelevant. If you compete for the moment, right, here's a new clever offering. Here's more of the same. Hey, we'll do three of those or five of these or eight of those. Yeah, you might be okay for the moment. But unless you start thinking about how you're going to compete in the future, that's the only time. That's the only way I believe you'll remain relevant. And that's critical for you to think about. How will you remain relevant to your most valuable asset, which is often your relationships? So in terms of the experience, I studied a lot about different industries. You know, we all think about the last time you bought something, right? We're all at the center. We evaluate. We consider. We discover. We come back to evaluation. We're constantly evaluating. We, we may buy something. We use it. We come back to evaluation. Did I like the person? Did I like the company? Did I like the service? Right? Would I recommend these people? Do I want to buy other things from them? And if you think about it, their brand, right? the news, relevant facts about them, marketing campaign, sponsorship, things we do about social media, contributes to our perception of their value proposition, right? the product, the service, what's the value, if they send me a coupon in advance, what's the, you know, after the sales service, and more importantly, how do they fit in my everyday life? Right? Do they fit in my life? Is this, are they simple, easy to work with? Is it seamless? Whether you know, I go online or if they have a store or if I see them in different places, is that experience seamless? All that leads to our, our experience. And that experience directly pipes into our evaluation. And again, there's a lot of great books. Biology is one. Um, there's a lot, of, um, uh, 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 a lot of great books on what influences us to think and act and behave. But if I just simplify it in terms of an experience, and again, think about your own experiences, the brand, the value proposition, and, and our everyday journey are the three pillars that contribute to that. So the co-create premise says, going back to how you're going to compete, you're not the smartest person in the room. A mentor of mine says, if you are, you're in the wrong room, right? You don't have all the answers. The market is really demanding, and it's demanding agility and nimbleness, right, from all of us. Nobody's got time or patience to wait for you for six months to do anything. So they really want, you know, more and more people want you to be agile, for you to be nimble, for you to move, right? Stop the, all the, you know, months of analysis. you got to move, right? Transparency is now the norm. And, and, and unique perspectives, right, is, are on those real nuances are essential. 
So don't treat me like everybody else, right? I do, and again, if you think of a consumer or a business, I do what I do. Our company has this unique needs very different than others. I want you to treat me less as one big bucket and more as individuals with individual needs, right? Lastly, every individual, every team, every organization has got to evolve to remain relevant. You have to evolve. By definition, if you don't, you're getting more disrupted, you're getting more, um, uh, kind of you becoming irrelevant at an accelerated rate. And, and again, I've got an Emory professor who always says, hear me now, believe me later. Because you're going to start seeing this more and more that what you thought was a great value proposition three years ago, five years ago, seven years ago, ten years ago, is no longer that, that, that valuable. And you're going to have to change your model to remain relevant. So what if, and I love what if questions, you co-created the next growth cycle, the next opportunity, the next um, you know, unique product, unique service through fewer but more meaningful and impactful strategic relationships. In the book, I actually call it the Jerry Maguire business model. Fewer, more real, more impactful relationships that develop a vested interest in your success. And again, newsflash, they could, they're employees, they're partners, they're customers, they're investors, they're media, they're out in the community. So they can come from any of those places, but it's not, this is not about casting a wide net. This is about really focusing on a few people that not just through what they say, right? We've all heard a lot of talk, but the way that they demonstrate a vested interest in your success. So in Relationship Economics, and I'm about to write the third edition of Relationship Economics, we created these six unique stages of how to develop those strategic relationships. That's why I'm calling Relationship Economics the prequel. On the left-hand side, you're mapping. In the middle, you know, you're doing the day-to-day -day stuff. Co-create is about the right side. It's about capitalizing on those few strategic relationships to really identify that next phenomenal growth opportunity. And just like you see here, I'm a big believer, and you've seen some of my more recent LinkedIn articles, in this idea of strategy visualization. So in the book, I show you several examples of case studies. So this is ThyssenKrupp. It's a global manufacturer of elevators and escalators and, and working with them on really fine-tuning that strategy. This is Hilton and their efforts to create a, a much more intimate relationship with their campus recruiting. Uh, so we changed it to campus conversations. We made the students the hero of the journey with Hilton coming up on each side and really working closely with those campuses. This is also another project for Hilton of, of their commitment to take you know, veterans and the incredible qualities and skills they have on the far left side, take them through a, a, a transition kind of period with some resources and then really opening the door, guiding them through the light of all kinds of phenomenal Hilton opportunities, if you will. This is another project with Phil of, of taking KPMG and their uh, anti-bribery and corruption practice and really creating a canvas for, Hill, uh, for KPMG to be able to go in and talk to global companies about their you know, potential risk profiles and kind of where they are and, and, and what they may or may not be aware of. So these are just some of the examples that, again, I cover in the book and uh, I share in how to more effectively do some of these things. So let's, let's make this more about you. Let's apply it to you. So implementing co-create, <laughs> again, we've also seen, a lot of, all of us have seen, these incredibly complex processes, and then some clever person comes and says, hey, by the way, at the end of that, that's where you see the pot of gold, right? Or, okay, now that we've seen all these great ideas, let's go back to our respective desks and really talk about why any of this won't work. So I didn't want to write just another book. I wanted to write a book that hopefully carried my voice, carried my passion for practical, pragmatic ideas that people can put to good use. Um, it's just like you and I, I hate going to training classes where you come back and you shove all your notes in a folder and, or you shove the binder on some bookshelf and it's gone. So, you know, a couple of years ago, I completely got away from any kind of workbooks for our training. Now we put up a poster and we put up tiles. And those posters go up in people's offices, and they revisit those tiles on a regular basis. So uh, the book itself um, is, is, uh, is pretty, pretty good, you know, a lot of good content, but it got to be a little bit you know, long. So we created a separate workbook. And I'm going to make this available to you for free, downloadable on our website. 
but in it are very practical tools on how to apply just some of the ideas that you're going to read in these chapters. And, and I don't want anything from you. What I want for you is really take these ideas and really think about what you're doing and really think about why you're doing it. And, and, and the commitment that what you're doing is just not going to remain relevant. I keep going back to that relevance. And, and by the way, are you really thinking about the experience journey you create for people you interact with? Are you really thinking about the evolution? If you're in a position to evolve your organization, are you thinking about each of these in terms of evolving your organization? So the workbook, again, this will be a free resource on cocreatebook.com. You can download it, and you can actually, as you read the chapter, I reference it. You can actually use these tools to apply some of the key ideas in each chapter. I also give you a lot of very specific examples. So as I interviewed executives, I said, well, tell me how that would apply. Or tell me why you would do that or how we would do that. And several times throughout the book, they took my key ideas and they said, okay, let me talk to you about how I would do that. So these are not just my ideas. These are, these are ideas that companies are using. Few companies are really using effectively in, in getting not only closer to their relationships that are important to them, but really helping drive their next evolution of growth. So eight ideas in the book we talked a lot about, and again, these are going to be some of the key topics. We'll go considerably deeper in each of the subsequent webinars. Introspection, you've got to adapt to disrupt. This idea of adaptive innovation, um, how do you identify faint market signals? How do you bring those in? How do you quickly uh, pilot and prototype key ideas? Strategic relationships, fewer. Um, unfortunately, websites like LinkedIn spoil us and that, that they somehow reward us for the more people you connect with or the more likes you get on Facebook, the more valuable you are. Says who? I'd rather work with fewer relationships that know me and have a vested interest in my success and understand my challenges and issues and are willing and able to kind of help me think differently about my business. So I want you to really start thinking about fewer, more meaningful, more real relationships because those are the people that are going to create an impact in your personal growth and the growth of your business. I guess, you know, you're a guest in your customer's journey, right? That reverse perspective is something I first heard from a, from a Hyatt CEO, and it just absolutely resonated. So a lot of companies, a lot of individuals talk about acquisition, acquisition in terms of acquiring a new customer, acquisition in terms of hiring a new employee. What about retention? What are you doing to create engagement? What are you doing to um, make sure they, they remain engaged and is excited about what they're doing you know, three, six, nine, twelve months, two years later than they do day one, or even you know in the interview process, for example. The the one one actually stands for uh, you know operationally kind of efficient, uh, needs based, and 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 really focusing on exceptional experiences, right? So I talk a lot about how do you create you kind of one organization, leading through provocation uh, is all about challenging the status quo. How many people you meet on a daily basis who spend more time, effort, cycles on defending their status quo, right, this is my sandbox, don't pee in my sandbox, I'm happy with my sandbox, versus um, maybe sand isn't the right thing for us to be playing with anymore, right? So are you challenging the status quo sufficiently enough? Are you being challenged? If not, I, at the risk of, of your employers never inviting me back to call or inviting me to come speak at your organization, life's too short. Life's too short for you to get up every day and do crappy work that you're not excited about. So, so challenge your own status quo. I said this is going to start with a healthy you. And if you start with your own status quo and really thinking about am I learning, am I growing, am I doing interesting work that I'm supposed to be doing, you're not going to be able to help anybody else. Spiral of growth, uh, I talk a lot about leading uh, drivers versus lagging indicators. Think about it a second. All the dashboards we see, all the reports we pull up, those are all lagging indicators. The results of what we've done in the past. Very few individuals, very few companies look at leading drivers. Very few tie compensation, tie metrics, tie kudos to leading drivers. Are you doing the right things to, with some degree of confidence, predict the results you're going to get? Exceptional experiences, they're not going to go away. Right? How do we start anticipating them? How do we start using cognitive computing and cognitive technology to help us anticipate what our relationships, what our customers, what our employees, what our partners are going to want from us next? And then last but not least, this idea of collaborative co-creation. We've actually built a canvas. We've built a canvas that 
uh, I'm really excited about, really proud of. I've applied it. It's several different you know, consultant engagements. It works if you if you learn how to use it. Uh, and the goal is to get that canvas. Also, we'll have a PDF of the canvas available on the website for you to download and use. So the canvas. It literally, those of you who know me, uh, know that I do some of my best thinking, best work while I'm standing up. And if you know, give me an easel, and it's amazing what I'll just kind of draw up. Even I tell people record it because you never know when a moment of brilliance is going to come from it. I was working on an engagement, and, and we literally started doing this kind of sideway funnel, if you will. And, and I kind of took them through different different sections of it, and I was explaining, and we kind of went through these kind of 10, you could see the 10 stages at the bottom, and, and that became the canvas. And, and I've taken several people through this canvas of here's how it works, and now this thing is up on you know, walls and, and it's become poster size and it's driving priorities and, and a lot of strategies and a lot of talent that we have that we don't, you know, we need or we don't have and they're going to be critical to us. So, um, again, we'll talk more about Canvas in the subsequent sessions, but Canvas is going to be one of the, one of the fun, fun aspects of, of uh, what I'm trying to do here. So, to kind of put the bow on this thing, hopefully, four principles, four operating principles for really impactful co-creation. Relationships, Really focus on empowerment, not hierarchy. Uh, I'm seeing more and more clients take layers out of their organizations just to reduce that bureaucracy. Or start building informal networks in your company because that's how influence happens. That's how actually jobs get done, right? So, so let's start leveraging relationships for, for really how do we empower people. And, and again, there's several ideas in the book on how to do that. Um, journey, you got to measure it and you got to constantly look ways, for ways to enhance it. And you got to enhance their experiences. Um, some of the most astute companies out there, if you think of Disney, if you think of, uh, again, Warby Parker, if you think of uh, Zappos for a long time, you know, they, they um, gladly, L.L. Bean, I love L.L. Bean, and I'm giving you some consumer examples, but you get the point, is, you know, we've bought thousands of dollars, I've written about this, from L.L. Bean because they have this lifetime, and a lot of other brands do as well, lifetime kind of warranty thing. We bought a bag 10 years ago, and it starts to fall apart. You call them, they're like, oh, yes, yeah, send it back to us. They don't even make that bag anymore, but they'll send you another one. They'll send you the newer model, right? That, that just built such a great experience, and you want to tell a whole bunch of people about it. Conversely, you know, you get a terrible experience with a brand. Likewise, you're going to tell a whole lot of people about it, right? So envision really thinking about the evolution of your compelling value. Uh, I'm doing work that I you know, didn't do three years ago, and it's become a pretty big piece of my business. Uh, I'm doing keynotes that I didn't do three years ago. Uh, I'm planning on for 18 all the way to 20, do, you know, evolving the business to, to do some really other interesting things. That's what you have to envision is how do I continue to evolve me, my team, my organization, my value add. Last but not least is alignment. Uh, last time I checked, silos are not conducive to collaboration. Silos just, you know, you've got to bridge those silos inside out. And inside out means um, really start like a family if it's dysfunctional inside the company. Everybody else sees it. But if you give people a common vi in a mission, common vision, or common enemy, it's amazing what they'll do together and how they'll work together to address that. So, so we talk a lot about alignment and some of the examples of the visualizations I showed you are a lot more about rings than there are uh, silos, than there are pillars. So again, if you haven't already, uh, think about questions you may have and some of the stuff I've presented and use the question section on the right-hand side of your screen and uh, I'll make sure I address those. So I'd love to continue the conversation. Uh, this week, the team is finalizing this uh, uh, co-createbook.com. That's the website. Here's kind of initially what it looks like. And again, we've got a lot of the parts and pieces that are coming. Um, again, those are the dates of the webinar series. Uh, if this was, this, this really was intended to be a high-level overview, um, each of the subsequent ones will go deeper. So next one is Tuesday the 28th, next Tuesday, same time, all 3 o'clock Eastern, noon Pacific. We're going to talk a lot about introspection. We're going to talk a lot about going deep into really thinking about your own growth, where you've been, what you've done, your team, and your organization. And through that introspection, we're going to uncover where you're most vulnerable, where you may be most stale, where you are, are, are destined to struggle if you're not struggling already, uh, where you're most susceptible to competitive pressures, where you're going to get squeezed for margin or cost, 
cost pressures, right? So we'll do we'll go a lot deeper into just you know what you get out of that introspection, and each of the subsequent dates and times, I'll go deeper into each of those topics. So again, I hope you'll mark your calendar. I hope you'll come back and join us for those. Um, we're actually doing a launch party. Uh, if you live, sorry for those of you who don't live here, but if you live in Atlanta, uh, details are coming. There'll be a section on our website where you can request an invite. We'd love to have you. Uh, it's probably going to be that first week in May, uh, one of the, the nights after work. Um, good location, good food, good drinks. Come and, uh, come and uh, celebrate this with us. I'm really excited. Uh, to get family and friends and neighbors and, and parents from my kids' school and Emory classmates and clients and all kinds of good folks together to come uh, celebrate this with us. Um, we're creating a, a co-create video, a simple animation to explain the key ideas and you're welcome to borrow it, use it, show it, reference it, uh, as long as you, 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 you remember the source of where it came from. Uh, so we're, we're going to put more resources on the website. Uh, there's some individual and bulk purchase orders or, or pre-order bonuses. I'll talk about more about those in a second. And then links to all kinds of articles. As I mentioned, I'm writing a lot more on LinkedIn, um, creating more videos. I did a Facebook Live yesterday about this one. I'm partnering with, with more folks. Uh, I think Jennifer Bridges is on this call. She's with PDUs to go and she focuses on, on that whole project management, a very important project management community for me and with me. So we're, we're going to do a whole series of things together. So, so great opportunities for you to continue to learn, continue to grow. Uh, Bob Muscat is another really good friend, and Bob focuses on profitable growth and the 80-20 business process. So we're going to talk about how to integrate co-creation in that. Mark Travis, 15-plus uh, years at IBM, and, and really looks at, at technology inhibitors and technology enablers. So we'll do some things together. So keep an eye out, and I would encourage you to visit that website uh, to get access to, to a lot of these things. So the last piece of this session is really is we're talking about as we lead up to that May 9th publication. Uh, we've partnered with some great folks. Again, if you just go to cocreatebook.com, you'll see that. For individuals, a couple of things I'm doing. I've uploaded eight CDs, basically the Relationship Economics book, uh, audio book, into MP3 files. So if you pre-order the book, we'll send you the, the Relationship Economics audio book. Um, as I mentioned, the co-create workbook, there's 20 plus tools, there's the canvas, uh, it is really intended to help you bring these ideas to life. I, I, don't, I don't need to hear myself talk, I've been thinking about these ideas to nauseam. I want to help you apply, internalize and apply some of these ideas in your work and in your company. And then um, I'm also going to record a 30 minute kind of how to use the canvas, a lot of interest in the canvas by itself, again, I'm giving you the PDF, by itself it's not nearly as usable as somebody kind of walking you through, showing you what, you know, the key sections, there's 10 steps, there's three phases to it, I want to walk you through that. So the video does exactly that, it's a 30 minute coaching video, uh, and again, these are all bonuses if you go to the website and pre-order the book. Um, I also have a lot of, lot of clients that, that, or teams that want to do this, so again, as you can imagine, enormous value in getting a small team. I, I like SWAT teams more than I like battalions. So get a small team together and really engage them in this collaboration and start putting some of these ideas to work, right? There's all kinds of customization opportunities. And again, you'll see links. Let me just toggle over to the website. You'll see links to, you know, we've partnered with BookPal and we've partnered with Bulk Books. But BookPal has got, and several of them do, everything from putting a, a signed book plate inside the book um, to look at this, Morgan Stanley, their logo on the cover, to they can put a seal right here in the front. Um, so there's all, they could do a wrap around. So there's all kinds of really cool customization capabilities with with the bulk purchase. Um, and I've given you roughly the price of them. A few, it's like a $28 cover price. Obviously, bulk you start to get some economies of scale. Uh, we'll throw in any free customization if you buy, you know, 25 to 100. 100 to 250, I'll do a 30 minute kind of executive or, or team coaching call. By 250, I'll do a, a 60 minute webinar or presentation similar to this one. By over 500, I'll do a keynote. Uh, I'll do a keynote for you, your team, your organization. Um, by 1000, I'll do a half day workshop. So a keynote and breakout or we'll come and do a half day workshop. We'll bring poster sized copies of the canvas with us. I've done this for several clients. 
um, and it's just a really good immersive experience. And then obviously by 1500, we'll do a full day. And some of those visuals you saw will actually create a rough concept for you, your team, your organization. So these are all, uh, again, pre-order campaigns. I'm trying to create visibility for this book. Uh, and I would, I would be grateful for if you think there's value in this for you as an individual or your team to grab one as an individual or bulk. And again, these will all be on that cocreatebook.com as well. So that's the hashtag. I hope you've used it during this session. Uh, I hope you'll continue to use it or come back to it. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tweet. I'm gonna get, you know, put some of the tools up on Instagram and and Facebook and LinkedIn. I'm writing a lot more articles on LinkedIn as, uh, around this. Um, and and um, I want you to think about another just final idea. I, I was on it. This is a this is a one picture, one piece of a of a uh, poster I was drawing for a client. And on the left hand side, those are S curves. And the S curves, as I thought about it, this is really what co-create is about. The S curves are all about you continuing to think differently about your your yourself, your value, your team, your organization. So the first S curve, you start something, you know, you gotta invest time and effort to learn it, so there's a downward kind of slope, and then it starts to take off. And people start to recognize it, and you start to do well. But at some point, it's going to reach a plateau. Ideally, you're thinking about your next evolution. You remember I said you next? You're thinking about you next before, right? As things are going well, you're investing in the green one, right? And you start to, again, there's a downward dip, and then it starts to take off. Now you've got two of them doing really well. And as the first, the black one starts to plateau, you're hitting the green ones on its stride. So you're always ideally are thinking about your next S-curve, your next kind of iteration, your next. And by the time you get to the second or third one, the first one really should be obsolete. You should have sunset that one. And the triangle on the right is all about you got to elevate yourself from commoditization, right? That lower level is commodities. A whole bunch of people sell your product or your service. Or even if they don't, they say the same things. So how do you constantly look for opportunities to elevate yourself from being a commodity to really specializing, to really being the go-to person for that particular need or that particular market demand? And the only way I know how to do that is through iteration, innovation, and disruption. Most people are very good at iteration. Few people are good at innovation. Very few have learned to disrupt themselves. That's what I hope co-create can become for you and your team. Let me pause here. I think we've got a handful of questions coming up. So, David, um, what do you see are the top three keys to success to have an effective co-create initiative? Um, David, great question. Number one, unequivocally, you have to have executive kind of sponsorship, executive oversight, executive accountability. You need one neck to choke. And you ideally want this executive um, to, to have this initiative as their priority. So if they don't have a vested interest in this, you're, you're, you're wasting time and money. Right? Think about it. Um, th these innovation centers that go up, it's somebody's pet project. It, it really isn't strategic. It really isn't a priority to a senior enough executive that will go to bat for it. Right? Number two, you got to get it away from the rest of the corporate bureaucracy. So we worked on a project where, I kid you not, an insurance company, right? It doesn't get any more mature than an insurance company. They've been around for, what, 1,000 years? Insurance company wants to innovate. So I said, you got told the CEO, three options. You can build it, you can partner for it, you can buy it. If you build it, it's going to take you a while. And it was fairly you know, expensive and it was in-house. And you partner for it, you're not going to have as much control and you're always at somebody else's, uh, right? That doesn't really work in that scenario. So we went and bought it. We went and found a really cool company and we bought it and brought them in. And I said, don't put them at your corporate headquarters. Why? Because the chief risk officer is there, the chief financial officer is there, the chief legal officer is there. I mean, all these parts of the organizations that are focused on killing any new shiny thing that comes around are all there. Let's take it off campus. So we set them up in a conference room away from the corporate headquarters. And it's now taken off in a huge way. So you've got you to gotta unshackle. You've got to get, get all the corporate kind of bureaucracies and all the corporate uh, clinicians and all the people that are, that are just hell-bent on killing it away from this new idea. The last thing you want to do is, again, pilot and prototype. Way too many people spend way too many cycles building things that nobody's going to care about 
or you're digging for 50 feet you know, below the surface for gold over there, and your gold is 5 feet below the surface over here. So the only way, and startups do this really well, incubators do this really well, pilots and prototypes. So I'll talk more about that in that session, but you want to quickly pilot something. You pilot something. You want to quick, and, and I've, for years I've told people, don't confuse selling and delivery, right? Don't worry about delivering to extend. Don't worry about delivering it. Let's go see if the idea resonates with anybody. Let's see if they're having the problem that we've researched or we think they're having a problem with before we go spend a ton of time, money, effort on, on building something. And again, my own example, I, I'm passionate about motorcycles. You saw that. A year ago, I, I saw a market opportunity. I came up with an idea. I raised a quarter million dollars from a whole bunch of friends, and I ended up paying all of them. I, I literally wrote them their checks back because I took the idea in front of a handful of people that I respected, I trusted, I, you know, potential customers, and you just it wasn't there. The, the idea was a way ahead of its time. And, and, and you know, if you're going to educate people, teachers don't get paid much. Right, so if I have to educate the market of my value, it's going to be a it's going to be a tough tough uphill battle. So, pilots and prototypes help you avoid some of those mistakes. David, there's there's a bunch of other ones, but I hope that that certainly helps get it going. Uh, William, uh, great content. Is there a scale or a rating system to see if you're good at co-creating? Absolutely. Um, one of the tools in the workbook is a is a kind of a co-create scorecard. And we gauge your progress as an individual, as a team, as an organization. And I give you some metrics to really think about. But again, I want you to think about leading drivers, not lagging indicators. A lot of the metrics that I found that are out there were all just kind of stuff behind you. You're driving while you're looking in the rearview mirror. That doesn't help you. You've got to look through the windshield. So what I, what I coach a lot of people, and we're going to talk about this on the canvas, are you doing some of the right things? Are you thinking about some of the right ideas to help you think differently about where you're going, what you're trying to do? So um, that's it for today. Again, if you have other questions, I'll stick around for a couple more minutes, but I hope you'll keep coming back to the future webinars. There's my contact information. If there's anything I can do to help you, by all means, please reach out. I hope you'll go to cocreatebook.com. I hope you'll pre-order a book, either for yourself or for your team. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing you next Tuesday, the 28th, March 28th, uh, at 3 Eastern, noon Pacific, for the next session in the series. Hope this has been useful to you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. Make it a great rest of the week. Take care. Bye-bye.